this video, we're going to talk about how to create input response space filling designs using the sequential design of experiments module in the focus tool set. If you'd like to hear um, a little bit more about just a general overview of the sequential design of experiments methodology that's covered in the module in support of scaling up carbon capture technologies, or if you'd like to know how to create some of the other space filling designs that are available in the focus SDOE module, then you can take a look at um, some of these other videos. In today's video, though, we're just going to be focused on how to create input response space filling designs in focus. In focus, there are six options for space filling designs um, that really cover uh, a lot of different potential scenarios. These include um, designs for whether this is the first phase of an experiment at a particular scale, or whether this is a sequential follow-on uh, experiment and we've already collected data at this scale that we want to incorporate. It also includes um, three different types of space filling designs. And for a discussion on how to strategically select the correct design methodology for your application, um, again, you can check out that overview video but today, we're just going to be focused on one of these options, which is where we're interested in carrying out a sequential design. So we've already collected data at the scale, and we want to incorporate that data, but also collect more data in a sequential design of experiments fashion using an input response space filling design. The example that we're working with is a model for an MEA system with three inputs, rich solvent flow rate, flue gas flow rate, and steam flow rate. And our test objective for the experiment is to identify optimum operating conditions for capture rates from 50 to 90%. We have an experimental budget of 25 experimental runs, but we're not gonna use them all at once. Instead, we wanna use the sequential design of experiments of methodology to really make the most of that experimental budget by splitting the problem up into stages to learn as we go in order to increase efficacy and use that budget more strategically. What that means is that we split the problem up into three phases, where first we were interested in exploring the input space, and then we wanted to do some model refinement and reduce uncertainty in our model, and finally, in the last stage, we move into optimization, where we start to narrow in on the optimum operating, the region with the optimum, uh, the region that leads to optimum operating conditions, while keeping in mind that our um, objective is optimization for CO2 capture rates from 50 to 90%. We allocated that budget of 25 experimental runs across each of these phases, and we use nine runs in the first phase for exploration via a uniform space filling design. In phase two, we allocated eight runs for reducing uncertainty in our model via a non-uniform space filling design. And now we're in phase three, where we're going to use the input response space filling designs to balance the spread in both the input and the response spaces to make sure that we, as we move towards the optimum, we're not losing sight of the fact that we want to uh, we want to cover capture rates from 50 to 90 percent. If you'd like to see how phases one and two came together, you can check out the videos how to create uniform and non-uniform space filling designs in focus. But today we're just going to focus on phase three. Phase three is going to employ those input response space filling designs. And we're going to use input response space filling designs when we know some information about what likely output values are going to result from particular combinations of the inputs. And that allows us to select design points that are going to be likely to result in a good distribution of the output values. So input response space filling designs are really looking to balance good space filling properties in both the input space and the output space. And this works by providing the experimenter with a collection of objectively best designs that move across a spectrum, balancing the space fillingness in the input and the response spaces. The way this works is first by specifying a candidate set um, where the candidate set uh, should span the entire feasible space. Um, and will have um, this, just like with uniform space filling and non-uniform space filling designs, the candidate set can accommodate irregular 
experimental regions. Um, we just want to make sure that our candidate set doesn't include any input combinations that are undesirable because the design will ultimately be selected from this candidate set. Um, in the title of this slide, I'm realizing that we are not specifying a candidate set with weights, rather we are specifying a candidate set with likely output values. Um, so in the input response space filling methodology, we're going to include a column of likely output values for each combination in the candidate set. This is usually going to be drawn from a previously validated model. And if the, um, it, and it'll be used to identify those desirable designs that have that um, space filling property in the response space. So if the model isn't it is not reliable, then we don't want to use um, input response space filling design methodology because um, we'll, we'll end up with designs that are not desirable. Um, if we have a model that is not re reliable, a better approach is to use a uniform space filling design um, rather than an input, re space, input response space filling design. But if we do have a previously validated model that we have confidence in that can give us um, predictions for what the response is likely to look at at different like look like at different input combinations, then we can use the input response space filling design. And again, the goal here is going to be to balance the space filling properties in both the input and output spaces. We're using the input response space filling design methodology in phase three of this example because our primary objective for this three phase experiment is to identify optimum operating conditions, in particular for capture rates from 50 to 90%. So we want to use input response space filling design methodology so that we can search for the optimum operating conditions across an entire range of capture rates um, that make it, it, across that entire range of capture rates. So make sure that we are focused from 50 to 90% and we're not losing sight that that's our range of output that we're really interested in. We don't have to worry about having low confidence in our estimates of what the outputs are likely to look like because we are going to use a validated model that we've been working with phases from phases one and two of our experiment. So we can use that validated model to determine the likely output values and proceed with the input response space filling design methodology with confidence. In this example for the MEA system model, again, we have three inputs, sol rich solvent flow rate, flue gas flow rate, and steam flow rate. And we have two previous um, experimental uh, designs that we want to include. So we've previously collected data from a uniform space filling design in phase one and from the non-uniform space filling design in phase two. And so we want to make sure that we avoid sampling close to where data has already been collected because repeating ourselves would be not a good use of our experimental budget. Um, sequential design of experiments methodology allows us to take into consideration data that we've previously collected and strategically place new data in such a way that we're not at risk of repeating ourselves of, of collecting data where we've previously already collected that data. And so that's why in this multi-phase approach, it's important to use the mechanism of sequential design of experiments to best allocate that budget across every phase of the process. Again, we're going to use a candidate set that comes from our existing model that we've been working with throughout each phase, and that will include the likely output values as a column so that we can make sure that we're spanning the space in the input and the output spaces. We're going to go over to focus now and take a look at how these pieces can come together to actually generate one of these input response space filling designs. So here we are in focus and we're uh, going to go into the SDOE module, make sure that we're in the space filling um, option because that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And we have our candidate set that we want to use. So we're going to click load existing file. We're going to load in our candidate set. And here it's just telling us that our candidate set is complete. We have no missing values. So that's great. 
we selected the file type as candidate. We also need to load in the previous two experiments that we've carried out, again, to make sure that we're best allocating the budget and not repeating design points or you know, nearly repeating design points that we've already um, collected data at. So we wanna make sure that we also include our designs from the first two phases and now I'm just going to make sure that file type says previous data. And again, let me load existing set. That was for phase one. I also need to include the phase two design. No missing data. And change the file type from candidate to previous data. Now I have my three files, my candidate set and my two previous designs. And I can view them all, make sure they look good. The important thing here is that in my candidate set, I've included my three inputs and then also that likely output value, that estimated response to use um, to uh, determine space filling properties in the space of the response. So that all looks good and I can click continue. And now here, Focus is telling me that I've uploaded my candidate file. It says aggregate here because if I had uploaded a couple different candidate files, Focus would go ahead and aggregate those together into a single file. In this case, we only uh, uploaded a single candidate file, so our aggregate here is going to look just like our original one that we uploaded. We did upload two previous experiments, one from phase one, one from phase two, and here um, Focus has aggregated those into just one file. As we generate designs in Focus, um, Focus is going to save those designs automatically in this location, which I can view. And if I want to change the location of that, I can do so in settings. And now finally, I can select the design method and I'm going to use the input response space filling design here. And now I can go ahead and open SDOE dialog. The first um, decision I can make is how big is my design? We have an experimental budget for eight runs for this phase of the experiment. So I'm going to select eight. And Focus adds this index column titled ID, which just allows us to really easily tell which candidate set point was included in the design. So I really like that. But if you don't like it, you can go ahead and unclick that. But I think it's useful to have. So I'm going to leave that checked. We have our three inputs, our three factors with the ranges for each, um, just as a kind of double check to make sure everything looks accurate. And then we have our response and we need to just change the type from input to response. And again, the min and max is from 0.5 to 0.9, from 50 to 90% capture rate. And that's exactly what we want. You know, that's the, that's the range we're working over. So everything looks good there. And now I can click Estimate Runtime, which is going to um, give me a, a general idea of how long it's going to take to generate this eight run design given um, some number of random starts. And I can select a higher number of random starts if I want, where more random starts just means the search is more thorough. So we're better, we're, you know, we're better able to find even better designs with more random starts. It's important to note that with non-uniform and input response space filling designs, the number of random starts can be a lot lower than for uniform space filling designs, just because the mechanism um, is very different for these two design, algor design search algorithms. And so um, these random starts are really a different type of random start. So because of that, um, we, can, we can select something like 50 and, and be in good shape, whereas with a uniform space filling design, the number of random starts is you know, in the thousands. All right, we could go ahead and hit run now um, and focus would give us our eight run input response space filling design. Um, which we can look at by going back to PowerPoint, we can take a look at what focus generates. So what focus generates is a collection of best designs. This is a Pareto front of designs, which, which is the collection of objectively best designs where each of these points on this Pareto front represents um, the best design in that, um, in that uh, space of trade-off between um, space filling in the, uh, 
space filling in the input space and space filling in the output space. So what we have here is a collection of designs that kind of walk through that spectrum of compromises where we can decide how much balance we want in the input of the out in the um, space filling of the input versus the space filling of the output. So for instance, the most extreme design on one side is shown in purple here. This is going to maximize the space filling of properties in the response space. At the other end of that spectrum, we have the red design, which maximizes this as the space filling properties in the input space. And then everything in between acts as some compromise with a different degree of balance between input and output space filling. Each design on the Pareto front represents the best design for that space along the spectrum. And so that's why we have this collection of best designs where the user can just determine what balance best suits the needs of the experiment. So it's a good idea to examine each of the designs, just click on it and look at the plot for each of the designs along the spectrum. And that way we can tell um, which, which design seems like it best fits the needs of the uh, experimental objectives. In this case, um, the, the designs kind of in the middle look really nice because you can see that the um, space filling in the response space is still nicely covered. We have a lot of coverage in the, in the outputs while still getting a good amount of um, space filling throughout the input space. So this is a really looks this green one looks like a really nice compromise. Um, and so that's what we can go ahead and select. In that way, we've really thoroughly still explored the input space, but also adequately covered the range of input in the interest in the response, making sure that we are um, obtaining uh, input combinations that are going to result in that entire range of outputs from 50 to 90 percent capture that we're interested in. So then what we'll do is um, operate the system at the eight input combinations specified by that selected input response space filling design. If we'd like to, focus also includes an ordering capability that reduces the required resources by um, ordering the runs of the design so that we're not making big leaps as we move from run to run. It, it puts the runs um, so that they're as close together as possible. So as we move through them, we're not having to change the system um, by huge amounts just to save on resources. In any case, you know whether we choose to use that capability or not, we'll operate the system at those eight combinations um, specified by the input response space filling design. We'll collect values of the response of interest at each of those input combinations. And again, we're making sure that we're likely to get a good spread of output values from 50 to 90%, which is the region that we're interested in, uh, in for this experiment. And then we'll incorporate that into the model for the optimization step to identify optimum operating conditions across that desired range of output values from 50 to 90%. And that's going to um, take us to the end of that phase three. So here we've walked through um, this example where we've, we've broken down our 25 run experimental budget in order to use um, in order to use it as wisely as possible, learning as we go at each step to increase efficacy by really harnessing and leveraging the sequential design of experiments methods that are available in the SDOE module of the focused tool set.